All right. Um, thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, I am so thrilled. Today's going to be so fun. Uh, we're going to talk through um, continuing our series on the book of James. We're going to do James 3. Uh, but I, I just kind of want to reiterate something that Ty, Ty just said. Um, I, I think it's a very powerful and true concept that we touch the skies when our knee hit the ground. And even as we were just worshiping here, I, I felt like it's almost like God said, there's no barrier, like no pandemic, no, uh, you know, no lack of having a physical space to meet in can separate us from the love of God. There's no barrier. And so today, today is going to be a place of encounter, not just a transfer of knowledge or of teaching, but of encountering the living God. And so I just, I just invite you to go ahead and in your, even, your, even in your heart, let your knees hit the ground and uh, be encountered by the living God. Um, before we even get into James 3 uh, at all, um, I had this to give, and I'll talk through some of, our, some of the things we've got going on, but um, in my heart, I was feeling like God was wanting me to say this, and it's, um, in dealing with our sins, sometimes we think God forgives the way people forgive. You know, we can get this sense about God that he's forgiven us, um, but he still remembers and he holds on to the hurt of it or whatever. And it's not even, we would never say it, but we sometimes think it. And I felt like God wanted me to say this to everyone watching today, and that's um, he's taken your sins and he's taking them as far as the east is from the west away from you. The actual sin he's taken as far as the east is from the west. Not just the guilt of your sin, not just you know, okay, I forgive you. You don't have to feel guilty anymore. No, no, no. He's actually separated you from the sin. It is no longer attributable to you. It is no longer attributable to you. God sees it that way, and it is that way. And so I just want to confirm that to you. If you've been struggling with feeling like, man, I just can't shake this feeling like I've done something wrong, I want to tell you God's already shook it off of your life. It, has, it, ha, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, carry, it doesn't carry you at all. It doesn't attach to you at all anymore. Uh, so that's kind of separate from what I'm talking about, but it's kind of the same as what I'm going to talk about. Um, like uh, Sam mentioned earlier, we've had some technical difficulties this morning, so we're not going to have any of uh, the scripture that I'm going to read up on the screen. So I invite you, before I even get into anything, go ahead and pull out your phone, take out your Bible Gateway or Blue Letter Bible or whatever Bible app of your choice, or your physical Bible. You can practice your sword drill skills. You guys remember sword drills? I was the king of sword drills. They'd be like, flip to Obadiah, and I'd be like, bam, I'm there. So if you, if you, need, if you got the physical Bible, do that too. We're going to be reading from uh, the New American Standard uh, Bible today. Um, and I just want to say this. Primarily the reason I'm reading from that version today, before we even get into any of it, is because uh, James is a wonderful book. There is some complexity in James, and sometimes I found even in studying it, it's a little bit, it seems like it, it causes some like differences of opinion in translation. So a New American Standard, that's, that's like a pretty literal translation, and anytime there's an assumption, they put it in italics. So if, they're, if the translator's assuming something to help it make sense, that you're going to find that there. Um, so we'll, we'll use that version today. Uh, I love James. It's so fun for me. It's such a great book. Um, Historically, though, I, I will tell you, historically, uh, it has not always received the highest praise from some, some of the uh, great church leaders <laughs> in history. Uh, going back to the Protestant Reformation, and I, I'll explain why I'm, I'm saying this in a minute, but going back to the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, you know, you had a bunch of people who left the Catholic Church because they disagreed with some of the doctrine. Um, and Martin Luther was one of the major kind of figures, major leaders of that Reformation, that Protestant Reformation. And he really did not enjoy the book of James very much. Uh, and that maybe is kind of understating it. But um, one time, I'll give you a quote from one time he was talking about how wonderful the book of Romans and Ephesians and Galatians and like the book of John are and about how they're so full of the gospel message, so full of the grace of God. And, uh, and he was just basically saying, you know, if, if you only had those books by themselves, you'd probably have enough for saving faith. You know, it's like, it, it, and he's probably right about that. I mean, you really, you really don't need much except for even one word from God about his grace in your life. Uh, but then he followed up and he said this, therefore, St. James's epistle or letter is really an epistle of straw compared to these others, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. And I just have to tell you, 
I think that is so wrong. <laughs> I think that is so false. When I read James, I see Jesus everywhere. And you know what? They don't, he doesn't even mention Jesus' name um, very often. I think maybe only once he mentions it or, or it mentions the Christ, but it's everywhere in James. And there's such spiritual depth in every chapter of James where he's going, he is going deeper. And if you just read on the surface, you might miss it, but he is. And he, Jesus is referenced all throughout. Um, I was even thinking about this. When we read the Bible, one thing that, Je- one thing that Jesus said to the Pharisees, uh, he says, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have life, but the scriptures are meant to lead you to me. That's Jesus. So when we're reading scripture, this should be something that's in the forefront of our mind. We shouldn't just be like, oh, Jesus isn't in here. No, like the scriptures are meant to lead you to him. So, so he is, how is he, right? Um, and so we should, we should look at it through that lens. So we'll jump into James. Uh, I, got, I get stuck. Whenever we do a chapter of the Bible, like, there's usually like one or two verses that just like jump off the page and I can't leave them. And it happened early in James 3. It's verses 1 and 2. I can't, I can't get off verses 1 and 2. I probably will at some point, maybe. We'll see. Uh, but it's an exciting passage. So, and, and even before we get there, I just, the, James 3 talks about the tongue a lot. The tongue, you know, so like what we say, even maybe our inward thoughts, what's our inward conversation, and then what, what comes out of us either through words or through expression. And it talks a lot about the importance of the tongue and, and, and that. But I never noticed this about James 3. Verse 1, he, he, he talks about teachers to start. And then he flows directly into the tongue. So it's not starting with, hey, watch what you say. It's starting with, who's teaching you? Who's teaching you? So we'll, we'll read verse 1 here. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. And I'll just put it a little aside here. That word stricter, that phrase stricter judgment in other translations is, is rendered greater condemnation. So there's, that's, it's kind of like they're trying to figure out how to say it. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Let not many of you become teachers. I was reading that and I was asking God, what does that mean, God? What does that mean? Not many of you become teachers. And I felt like in my heart as I was reading that, he was asking me the question, Jack, who's teaching you? Who's teaching you? Where are you learning what you're learning? What's guiding your inward thought? Do you have many teachers or do you have one? Because in truth, I'll tell you this, in truth, there's really only one teacher. It's sword drill time. We're going to go to Matthew uh, 23, 6 through 8. I'll give you a second to look it up. Not too long. It's a little, little quicker if you're using it on your phone probably. So Matthew 23, 6 through 8. And Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And, and, and I guess really talking to the disciples about the Pharisees. But he's, he's basically telling them, hey, don't do what the Pharisees are doing, you know, or, you know, you can do what they tell you, but don't do what they're doing, because they're doing this thing all wrong. And I'm going to start at verse 6. It says, they love the places of honor at banquets, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and respectful greetings in the marketplaces, and being called rabbi or teacher by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. One is your teacher, and you are all brothers. If we go back to James, let not many of you become teachers. There's one teacher. See how Jesus is interwoven in this? Now, again, there could be some truth to saying, hey, you don't want like a hundred different people teaching on a Sunday. I get that. But I think really the deeper meaning here is that you don't want, the, the issue that we run into oftentimes is that we have too many. In verse two, it says, for we all stumble in many. In fact, if we stumble in anything, it's probably that we stumble in many. Because if our eyes were truly fixed on the one, would we be stumbling? I don't think so, right? We stumble in many. One, um, one thing that I, I love Andrew Womack uh, has said, and I've heard him say this in the past, he talks about how oftentimes the problem in our life is not our lack of faith. We usually have enough faith to conquer anything that's, that's happening in our life if we're a believer in Jesus, right? That faith is provided um, as in, our, in our life. So the problem isn't that we have enough faith, it's that we have other things as well, like doubt or unbelief. So, 
So the problem and the reason why we stumble and the reason why we fail isn't because we don't trust God. If we're Christians, we usually do trust God. It's because we have doubt and unbelief and all these other sources of information we're hearing from, right? And that's the thing that comes and holds us back from the manifestation of God's power often is, is, this, is this outside sources. It's the many. And, and I will just say this. I'll jump down here and just say, you know, to this point on, on stricter judgment, um, in verse 1 there. Jesus also commented on this with the Pharisees, right? These are people who are teaching the Scriptures. They're teaching the law, but they're not teaching about Jesus. And he says, you know, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes. It's going to sound very similar. And like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers, these will receive greater condemnation. And it's like Jesus is calling them out and saying, hey, you, what you're saying teachers has in impact, right? And it's, it's, I'm not even saying that this applies necessarily to, to Christian teachers. It, it might, but I think this is really attacking the idea that, hey, you know, are you teaching the one? Are you teaching Jesus? Because um, I think that's, that's really where he's going with this. Step two, or verse two, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Do you see Jesus in there? If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. There's one, I'll tell you, there is one who never stumbled in anything he said. And it's not me, <laughs> that's for sure. It's probably not you. Well, no, it's not you. Um, it's Jesus. That's the perfect man. And if we even go back to, you know, I, I even like to backtrack a little bit into, into the previous chapter, chapter 2, you know, some of the things that James brings out towards the end of the chapter are very clearly highlighting a God who made a promise and then fulfilled that promise. He talks about Abraham. He says, you know, was not Abraham justified by works when he offered up Isaac as a sacrifice, right? And Isaac, in that story, it's so cool. It's like Jesus is all over it. It's like that is the most clear picture of the gospel message that you can find in the Old Testament. Abraham, God gives him a promise of a son, and that son's Isaac. And the son of promise, Isaac, God says to Abraham, Isaac's father, he says, go and sacrifice your son. And so he takes Isaac to this hill. And it's very likely, if you look at his historical pictures, it's very likely that the hill he took the son of promise to was the very hill that Jesus walked the, uh, when he went to the cross. And so Isaac walks up this hill and he's carrying the wood for the sacrifice on his back that probably is bringing up pictures, right? And then he gets to the top of the hill and almost, it's almost like God wanted us to see it, right? It's like metaphorically, Abraham's there ready to sacrifice his son. And it's like, it's like God raises Isaac from the dead by stopping Abraham from killing Isaac. And he goes, no, 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 no. You're, and this is the moment when he's justified by faith. See, it's not enough, and I'll just say this, it's not enough for God to make a promise to Abraham, hey, you know, I'm going to give you a son of promise and Abraham believes it and that makes him righteous. No, no, God actually had to take action on that. Because, listen, if God makes the promise to Abraham, hey, I'm going to make you righteous because you believed on me and God doesn't follow through with his son being, being sacrificed and then raised from the dead, his, his righteousness is based on nothing. There's no justification there. So, so what I'm saying is there is a perfect man who followed through on everything he said. God follows through on all of his promises all of his promises are yes and amen, right? Yes and let it be so. Everything he says. So it's not like God will come to you with a promise as though the promise in itself, all by itself, feeds you. No, he's a God of action who follows through on his promises. He's a God who keeps his word. He's the perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. And I think there's oh, so much depth here I could get into, but I think this might even be talking about how, you know, God is able to direct us as a church, with his words. Um, yeah. Well, and I'll just say this too. We'll, we'll come back to this idea. We're going to stay here just for a minute. I'll come back to it. Who's teaching you? Who's teaching you? You know, we got a lot going on in our world right now, uh, <laughs> if you haven't noticed. And there's a lot of voices telling you what you should think, what you should believe, and how you should act. Uh, I'm in a really cool situation where I've got close friends who are like super conservatives and I've got close friends who are like super liberals 
And it's really funny. I just kind of ask them questions and then just hear their response. And I don't really give my opinion very often because I just want to listen. I'm trying to learn, you know. And it's so crazy how confident everyone is in their perspective. And in my mind, when they answer, I just go, okay. I mean, are, have you prayed? Have you asked God what he thinks? Do, do you have God's opinion on this? Are you sure? Have you talked to him about it? Because, in, you know, it could be that no one's really asking, you know. We could have our viewpoints and say they're God's, but, you know, have we asked? Uh, and so it's kind of fascinating when you start to think about, you know, who your teacher is. Is your teacher a news source? Is it a person? Who's teaching you? It's a great question to ask yourself because whoever teaches you is going to end up guiding what you say and what you teach others. Your teacher, whoever it is, they're the one who's going to have power over your words, and the words that you speak will have power over your life. It's super important. And this is why verse 1 about, you know, when, in James where it talks about, you know, let not many of you become teachers. Well, it's really important who your teacher is. That's why he's starting here before he even gets into the tongue, because where are you learning what you're saying? Where do kids learn where they, what they say? Well, they learn from their parents. Who's your parents? Who's your daddy? Right? Who's teaching you what to say? A uh, quick story here. It's kind of fun. Um, so, and I'll tell you, so Jana, uh, my wife Jana, she gave me permission to tell this story. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it was like sometime around Christmas, and uh, we were getting ready. It was going to be a really busy Christmas day. Like, I don't know if you have that in your families where you're like, go, 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 Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, but it was going to be that. And we were like... It, there was a lot of packing to do because we were going to be spending the night at my parents' house for one of the nights. And then there, there was like a lot of planning we had to do and getting our house ready and getting presents ready. And it's kind of, the, you know, the chaos of Christmas that sometimes happens. And uh, so anyway, it was maybe a couple days before Christmas and we weren't really ready to go. We were just planning on the next couple days doing it. And I got super sick, just like super sick, like lay in bed, can't do anything but sleep, sick. And it's hard, you know, if you're married and you've got kids, you've probably experienced this. When the other person gets sick, it's usually harder on the person who's not sick because then they have to do everything, right? And so all of the work that, it was just terrible timing for me to get sick. All of the work that had to be done fell on Jana. And so Jana had to do it all, and I'm basically just sleeping all day. And um, so, but when you're sick, you kind of want people to sympathize with you, right? Like, you kind of want them to go, oh, that's really hard. I'm so sorry for you. Well, and Jana wasn't doing that, you know, because she had to do all this stuff, and I totally get it. Um, and and she, she was honestly probably fighting being angry at me a little bit for being sick. It's like, oh, come on, Jack, you can't get sick right now. I need your help, right? So, so anyway, you know, everything worked out. It was fine. But, but afterwards, we talked about it, and I, I had to kind of tell her, hey, that was kind of a little bit hurtful to me, that there was, like, no sympathy at all, no empathy, and you were kind of, like, a little bit angry at me, it felt like. And she's like, I know, I know. She's like, it was just a really hard time. So we talked about it. She said she was sorry. I forgave her. Everything was good. Um, and then fast forward here to about a month ago. We're on vacation, the last day of vacation, right before we've got to pack up and leave. And we've got, like, a fun event planned for our family uh, kind of that last day. The night before, I'm up like a good portion of the night just really sick, you know, throwing up, and it was not fun. And in the back of my head, there was this thought that was teaching me, right? And it was going, oh, you're going to have a hard day tomorrow with Jana. She's not going to be happy with you, right? But I didn't recognize it. We have these subtle teachers that I think subconsciously are there. And so I got up the next day, and I was kind of just prepped for her to not be too happy with me because I slept in a little bit. We were get, trying to get ready to go. And so we had planned to go to Grand Rapids. And so she, she asked me, she goes, so she goes, are, are you feeling okay enough to go to Grand Rapids? Like, what, like, are you feeling okay enough? And in my head, I heard that as like, like, are you going to kill our fun? Are you feeling okay enough? Like, I heard it as attitude, and I took it as that. My ear was like hearing her coming at me. My perception was that she was, you know, and uh, throughout the day, the rest of the day, it was that way for my ear the entire day. And so we got to the end of the day and I talked to her about it. I said, hey, you know, I just felt like you were really, you know, kind of coming at me a little bit and I can't help it that I was sick. And she was like, Jack, she's like, I don't know what to tell you here. It sounds like you're really believing the worst of me. And in that moment, I had this like realization 
And there was even, I, I even felt like it was a tangible voice. It wasn't the voice of God, I can tell you that, but there was a voice that said, she's lying in my heart. How crazy is that? It's wild. But, but here's the thing. It's so difficult when you have a perception and you see things a certain way and you've allowed something to teach you. It's really hard to hear anything else. And so when you're encountered with that, you know what it was? It was easier for me to make her a villain than it was for me to change my perception. It was easier for me to make, and we do this all the time with people, we, we would rather make someone an enemy or a villain than admit that we saw something incorrectly or that we were taught something incorrectly. Because in reality, you know what was teaching me during that? It was my hurts, my past hurt. You know, it said this earlier, you know, God forgives and he, he forgives, not like people. And I think sometimes we think we forgive, but we hang on to the hurt. And I don't know why we do it. It's probably like we try to protect ourselves from it, you know, but we, hurt, we hang on to our hurts and then those hurts end up teaching us. Or maybe the, you know, the devil or whatever, a tap on the shoulder, points at the hurt, and that's what's teaching us again. And so I want to encourage you that, that you know, that's maybe one of the things that's teaching you. That's maybe one of the ways that you're learning. And I want to tell you that, that you need to not have that teacher in your life. We need to give it to God. Humility, right? Place of encounter and experience with God. Give it to God. Encounter him again in that. Yeah. So, because here's the thing, and this is where we go in James 3. So, verse 3. Now, if we put bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Go down to verse 5. So, so also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. And that's really true. What's your self-talk like? What are you teaching yourself before you say it? It's so huge. I felt like God was um, telling me this maybe even last night when I was praying, kind of praying for everybody. Um, I felt like he said, I'm a jealous God and I want your ears. I'm a jealous God and I want your ears. It's kind of like, you know, you don't want your spouse, of course, cheating on somebody with you. Even if that person's a great person, you don't want them. That's not, and he goes, I'm a jealous God. I want your ears. I want your ears. Because that's how he brings life into us, is through his words. He plants the seed, and the seed bears fruit. God wants our ears. Because he knows when he gets our ears, he also gets our tongue and what we produce. And then, I love this. It, we'll continue on in verse 5. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. <laughs> that's, very, that's pretty heavy. You know, but I, I think and there's a quote here that I, I wanted to kind of read. I was reading a commentary on this by Matthew Henry, and he said this, Hell has more to do with promoting the fire of the tongue than men are generally aware of. It is from some diabolical designs that men's tongues are inflamed. Have you ever been really passionate about something? Like just super fired up passionate? In those moments, check your teacher before you speak. Where is it coming from? Because, you know, hell has an agenda for your tongue. It wants to control your tongue. I, I love this. Okay, so this was super cool for me. Uh, so verse 6, and sets on fire the course of our life. New American Standard reads, course of our life. That word course is only used, if you go back to the Greek, it's only used in the book of James. It's not used anywhere else in the Bible. And it actually means wheel. Or it has, it has some maybe, if you look at some of the other places in like Greek writing where it's used, it could give the idea of potentially running. But it's like a cyclical, like one step in front of the other. Like it's, it's a wheel. And then the word life there, so it sets on fire the course of life. The word life there is actually, the root is Genesis. So it sets on fire the wheel of Genesis. I got stuck there for a minute. I was like, oh man, what does that mean? Because <laughs> that's kind of crazy. What I, like, that's not straightforward when you dig into it. But really what I think it is, you know, let's think about the cycle of how things are produced in our life. You hear something, you believe it, you receive it, you say it. What you say gets heard by somebody else. They believe it, they receive it, they say it. The wheel, the, cir the circuit, they hear it, they pass it out. 
Hell's goal and agenda in your life is to set on fire the wheel of your genesis, the wheel of your origin, right? So, so what it's doing is give you the word, right? For, in my case, it was Jan is just trying to, she's trying to poke your buttons, right, in that story. She's trying to poke your, not true, trying to poke my buttons. I say it. I get it out there, right? She starts hearing it and going, oh, Jack, there's something off with Jack. He doesn't think the best of me. He doesn't love me, right? And then she communicates, right? So it's get this, get this hell cycle <laughs> of us being unloving to each other. Get that started. Get that started. And, it, and in, in a sense, really what he's going for is your origin. So it's like, wh- what, what is the fundamental thing in you? So like, think about, think about this. When you were born, were you, were you planned by God or were you a mistake? I like asking that question. There's, gonna, there's potentially, in some people's lives, they feel like they were a mistake. Maybe even parents told them that. And it's not true. God had a genuine plan for your life. He knew you before you were born. He planned you before you were even alive. So, yeah, God did have an origin story for you, but do you know that hell probably is trying to undermine that origin story for you? What about your new creation story? What about being saved by grace through faith, the moment of your salvation? There's probably an agenda by hell, I think, to uproot that in your life and say, well, you know what, you're still a flawed human being. You're not a new creation. Let's go back to the old way, right? Redefining your creation, redefining your genesis, your origin. And in that way, cause you to produce that, that aspect of fire and hell in the world around you. So, and it really does come back to, it, you know, it's our tongue, but it also comes back to our ear. It's because that's the way we function. Yeah, and I love this, verse 7. And here's another thing where I go, man, Jesus is, Jesus is all in this. Verse 7, for every species of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It's like he's putting this out there and saying, yeah, nobody can do it. But you know what Jesus did? There was a perfect man who tamed the tongue. You might not be it. And so, and so this brings us back to this, this place where we're at. And, 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 and a little later, even in verse 10, it says, From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My, brother, my brethren, these things ought not to be this way. There, there, we, we have this tendency to bless God and then curse the people that he created in his image. This should not be this way. Why is it this way? Well, it's because of this. You know, Christianity, can I tell you what Christianity is, is not an attempt to make yourself a better person. It's actually what it is, if, if, if you get to the root of what Christianity is, it's that the old you, the person who was born into sin, that person died. And a new person died has been raised to life in Christ Jesus. That, that's Christianity. It's not how much better or closer to perfect can we get. No, it's, it's the imperfect you who is never capable of perfection, who cannot do it, right? No man can tame the tongue, can't do it. That person died, and there's one that's come. That's come. He is the one who saved your soul. So as we have faith and trust in him, we, we have a resurrection life in us that's supposed to be producing the things that are coming out of us. So it's not supposed to be that this thing where we try our best to say the best things and be righteous before God and even, you know, have good words and good beliefs. It's, no, the old me is dead. I'm taking on, like, the grace of God in my life. That's going to be the central point of my focus. And, and even if I make mistakes, he takes those away and he forgives, and then he gives me righteousness again, and I'm there again, right? It's, it's, this, it's this cycle of God, right? God's righteousness growing you and making you into the image of Christ over and over and over again. Because it shouldn't be that way, right? It shouldn't be the way where we're, where we're doing both. This dual person. You're not a dual person. You're a man or, or a woman of God, a child of God. And we'll jump down to verse 17 here. He says, he says more in this chapter. I, I don't know that I'm going to get into probably all of it, but verse 17, I love this. It kind of confirms this whole thing of the central focus of Jesus in our life. But the wisdom from above is first pure. The wisdom from above is first pure. I love that. The wisdom from above is first pure. It's like, th- what does pure mean? Pure means, like think about pure gold. Pure gold is gold without anything else. Pure gold is singularly gold without anything else. It, it's, been go- it's gold that went through the fire and had all other contaminants removed. Wisdom from above is first pure. 
Where's the wisdom in your life coming from? What sources, right? We come back to that. And then what are you, what are you taking in with your own tongue and speaking out to others? It's going to direct your life. It's going to direct your church. It's going to direct your community. Where is it coming from? Where's the focus? And then after it's first pure, it is then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. That's wonderful. Think about if you live that way. Peaceable, gentle, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. That comes from a wisdom that's first pure. So I want to encourage you today, in the middle of uh, quarantine, (laughs) in the uh, middle of political tension, where everyone's trying to put their words in your mouth. Everyone's doing it. You're about to get bombarded on social media with so much propaganda from both sides. It's not just one side. Everybody's doing it, okay? You're about to get bombarded this next probably six months. Make sure your eyes are on Jesus. He's jealous for your ears. He doesn't want you just chasing after a good idea because you know what? A lot of times things are built on faulty, faulty premises and it might sound logical, but in the beginning of it, the premise was flawed. And, and it's so hard to keep track of all this. So I just tell you, keep your eyes on Jesus. I'll say one more thing here too to kind of give you a picture of what I mean by that. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that God kind of put in my heart was approve of what's excellent. Approve of what's excellent during a lot of the kind of the racial tension we've had. Um, recently, and I'm not going to get into all that, but I, I felt like he was like, approve of what's excellent. And so he started asking me, Jack, what's, ex- what's excellent? What, what do you see that is above reproach that's excellent that you can approve of? I said, okay. And I started thinking about it and praying about it, and the thing that caught my eye um, was that one of my friends, a really close friend of mine for years, uh, he posted something that was really honest. It had no political agenda Um, He even called that out and said, yeah, I'm not doing this with political agenda in mind. He's like, I just want to share my experience. And it was an experience of um, a hurt that he had experienced in his life because of some of the racism or or racial tension or prejudice, whatever you want to call it, that we've experienced in our society. And he was just very honest about it. And it was a real hurt that had been something in his life and something that he has to grapple with probably on a daily basis. And so he shared that. And... uh, that was awesome. I thought that was excellent because he's, he's not trying to promote an agenda. He's just saying, hey, here's where I'm at. Th- this is where I'm at in this. And I was amazed to see hundreds of people commenting and giving as much love as they knew how to give to him about how much they thought that was awful and they cared about him. And, they, and I go, man, that's excellent. You talk about healing wounds. That's like, you got, you know, it's like you, love is the only thing that can do it. You know, Jesus, there, there's so many things that Jesus could have done and said to fix all the problems in the world, but you know what he gave? He gave, his, he gave love. And he goes, man, that's the thing. And so as we approach all these things, and even people who disagree with us on, on political topics in, in every way, I, I just want to encourage you, it's really important, let your mouth be that which speaks excellent things. Give it to God. Entrust it to God. And even, it, I'll, I'll say, we're in a period of transition in our building and with this pandemic and everything. L- let our words, God, let our words be things that bring love and life to every situation we're in. Help us refocus on you. When we get fired up, let us get fired up for love. Hmm. Oh, God, let us not get fired up for our own righteousness our own self-righteousness, our own moral high grounds. God, help us, help us to be just dedicated to your love for us and for the people around us so that we can speak words of life. Yeah. Yeah, I love you guys. Um, I love you guys. I, I hope uh, everyone here has had a chance to really kind of encounter God and, and hear, hear the voice of God and be taught of Jesus today. Uh, Mike's going to come up in just a minute. And I, I guess I just have this one thing in my heart. I just want to encourage you again. Like, dude, there's so much grace. There's so much grace. And if, you, if something got bricked in your heart today and you were like, ooh, I've kind of missed that. There's, there's a quote by, uh, I can't remember the guy's name. It's a pure, an old Puritan leader. He said, for every, every one time I look at myself, I take 10 looks at Jesus. 
And so if there was, and I love that sentiment, I so agree with that. If, if there was something in your heart, and you, you measured yourself and you said, ooh, I've maybe been hearing a wrong teacher. Just know, listen, there's so much grace. Take one look at yourself, but you know what? Take 10 looks back at Jesus and see his forgiveness and grace and mercy in your life and let that stuff go. Let's take the next step forward in grace. Mike.